All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Irrational Confidence Podcast. We're talking college football, and it's already here. We're here in the 2023 season. It's week zero. There's not a bunch of games, but there's enough for us to talk about it. And the man joining me for the third season in a row, it's time to talk regular season football, not the previews, not all of our projections. We're going to talk about games on the field. My co-host, Fresh. Fresh, how are you doing? Perhaps it's like uh, it's Christmas Day, New Year's Day, any kind of holiday you think of. Got games that actually count. Um, fans in the stands, fans, cheerleaders, running out of the tunnel, all that fun stuff. And uh, Saturday can't get here fast enough. Yeah, I, I would I'd push back a little bit on Christmas Day because it is still week zero here fresh. But I get it. The excitement is palpable. If I said that word right. I think you blended pal- palpable and happle in, in together. So that worked out pretty well. Yeah, same thing. All right, Fresh, let's roll with this. Let's get right into the first game of the week. Uh, So our first game this week is the OU Bobcats, the Ohio Bobcats traveling out to San Diego State. They're going to play this at Snapdragon Stadium, one of the best names for a stadium in college football. Right now, San Diego is sitting at a a two-and-a-half-point favorite at time of record. This is a fascinating game for me, Fresh, because both of these teams are projected that they got uh, an outsider's chance to win their conference. OU's got the chance to win the MAC. We always love ta- talking MAC And then San Diego State could be kind of that sleeper team in the Mountain West. What do you got going on with Ohio versus San Diego State? Well, I think the Bobcats and Aztecs is actually the best game of the whole weekend, folks. Um, tune into FS1 at 7 o'clock Eastern because this is going to be the best full on matchup. Like, you know, Hap said, a, a powerhouse team out there in the Mountain West in San Diego State. Last year, Ohio had the best record in the MAC, and Curtis Fork, the quarterback towards ACL, didn't play in the final game. That's end up losing the championship game too. If he's healthy, I'm sure they win the MAC outright in the in the title game. So, uh, a lot of excitement. Two great teams coming back, and one really exciting note is that I mentioned Curtis Fork, the quarterback for Ohio, towards ACL last year late. There is a strong rumor that he's actually healthy and ready to play this week, which is a miraculous comeback because that was November of last season, and he's able to probably get going week one. Uh, actually, week zero. You know, sorry, week zero. Um, miraculous comeback for him to be healthy enough and to recover and get back to playing shape. Um, so it's great to see that. You want to see everybody healthy when the season starts, and you want to see the teams out there with the full health. You don't want guys, you know, missing games or anything like that. So we're in, we're in for a treat. I'm looking at this football game. It's not just about Curtis Work quarterback who put up a great season last year and the year before, but I also think Bobcats running back Say Bangera, who uh, had a great year last year, burst on the scene. Over 1,000 yards in his first season, 13 touchdowns, uh, 222 carries. Definitely a bell cow there for the Bobcats. So the two of them, in the air and the ground game, they bring, they bring a very big offensive you know, juggernaut to this football game. They're going to put up points. Um, when it kind of looks at the other side, the Essex have always been known for their defense. Brady Hoke comes in there, has built a model after he came back. He started originally, went to Michigan, came back, has built a defensive model there in San Diego. And – this team is kind of have to keep that mentality going. They lost a lot of talent to the NFL last year, so they're going to see the first appearance of who's going to step in and fill in those shoes. Um, if their defense isn't ready to play, how is this offense going to show up? Last year's offense really was not fully functioning. Um, quarterback Jalen Maiden took over for uh, Burmeister Bur- last year, put up a thousand yards, uh, twenty two thousand yards, excuse me. Uh, 12 touchdowns, 10 interceptions, really just never got the offense totally flowing. He was kind of hit or miss the entire time. He also ran for about 200 something yards and a couple of touchdowns. So he's got to improve that touchdown to interception ratio. He's got to become more efficient. You hope last season maybe gives him a chance to get that experience and build off of that going this year. If that offense does not progress, they might be in tough shape. They have talent, but it's raw talent there at San Diego State, and they're playing a very veteran Ohio team. So that's where it's going to be interesting to see how fast does San Diego State get up to speed and ready to play. Are they, are they going to build off being in the home crowd? And is Ohio in the jet lag traveling out there? There's been definitely some weather out in, in California, if you haven't been paying attention to the news. How is that going to play into it? It's going to be very wet, moist. Probably the flooding will probably receded by then, but where is that going to come and how the guys are going to be able to adapt and react to the football game? When you kind of look at the Aztecs' offense, though, outside of the passing game, they're really known for being a running back, um, prolific offense. They find guys who come in there and just tear it up. But last year was kind of a letdown. They didn't have that dominant tailback. You look at Jalen Armstead, Keenan Kirsten, they were more effective, but they just never got truly going. 
They had nobody rush for more than 390, 390 yards in the season. So nobody really bursted out and took a, took a hold of that, that job. And it was kind of spread among seven different guys who had had about 150 yards rushing or more. And you got to find somebody who's going to really truly line up and take that number one job as a running back and be able to drive it home and get a thousand yards. So I want to see which of those two running backs, or if there's some other freshman coming in, who's going to take that job for San Diego State and run with it behind that offensive line and let that, dof- that defense sort of gel and get up to speed. Um, when it comes down to it in the very end, I truly think the Ohio Bobcats have a more of a veteran football team to come in and get this done. And I think at the end of it, they went 24 to 13, um, kind of a bumpy start for San Diego State. They'll get their offense going mid the year when they get a conference play. But I think Ohio, especially with Rourke coming back, give a little spark to that team. And the Bobcats start off week zero with, with the W. Yeah, C- Curtis Rourke was announced today that he is trending to start in this game here. Fresh, he completed 69% of his passes last year for over 3,000 yards. Kids accurate, and that's the big thing for college quarterbacks. Are you able to hit your receivers? He's got a great one on the outside there, Sam Wiglutz. Uh, 73 catches last year, 11 touchdowns. I'm interested, I'm interested to see his matchup against the top cornerback for San Diego State, and that's Des Malone over there. That should be an interesting matchup. How that matchup goes should be how the game goes. If o- OU is able to get kind of rolling early on, then this could be a long afternoon for San Diego State. Because San Diego State can't play from behind. They weren't able to do it last year. I know that there's all sorts of talk about changes that they made to their offense. Fresh, they had 26 offensive touchdowns last year. That's it. Rushing and passing. This is not the greatest offense that's on there. They lost their best offensive tackle to the transfer portal to Ohio State. They're rebuilding a little bit of that offense line. I have the same thing for you. You said 390 there. My note exactly said you didn't have a single running back over 400 yards last year. And so, okay, well, were you a run and shoot offense? Were you a spread them out, you know, spread offense, five wide receivers all over the place? And Jalen Maiden only threw for 12 touchdowns to 10 interceptions on the year. They need more from him. And this is going to be really a game that we're going to need to see San Diego State and the Aztecs. Can they really keep up with the high power offense of Ohio? OU could be the best offense, and that's no disrespect to Toledo because Toledo's got pretty good offense up there as well. But Ohio is returning almost everybody on offense. And they had a great year. They're the MAC runner up, losing to Toledo in the MAC title game last year. They beat Wyoming in the Arizona Bowl last year. We're really kind of high in that Mountain West on Wyoming. They're moving on up there. But you're right. San Diego State, it all is going to come down for defense. They had 36 sacks last year. They're averaging over three sacks a game. Can they continue to keep that type of pressure on the quarterback? If they, if San Diego State can continue to pressure Rourke all day long, force him into tough throws, you know, I, I, I don't want to say because, again, rehabbing that knee, are you letting him trust that knee? Is he going to feel confident if he's got to take off? Can you put that type of pressure? If you could t- take that type of pressure, that OU offense maybe stutters a little bit, and you can kind of get them out to a lead. Now, they got the firepower to come back on you, so watch out here. But I'm telling you here, Fresh, I I have a lot more questions about San Diego State than I do Ohio, so I'm going with the Bobcats winning. I don't care. That two and a half doesn't scare me right there because that's kind of home field advantage. So th- from what Vegas is kind of telling me, this game is pretty much straight up on a neutral field. I, I like the Bobcats in their offense in this one. So may, I'm going OU straight up win on this one. Um, and even if you maybe, maybe if you found a way to kind of take a little bit more on that one, you know, go for it. Cause I think Ohio is going to really kind of light up the scoreboard in this game. Yeah. I think they left a lot out there last year and they're, they're focused and driven this year to have a good one. All right. All right, fresh. Let's go to our second game. This is our fan vote. So folks, if you have not already, subscribe to the channel and follow us on social media. Each and every week during the season, we put up our fan vote onto Twitter, letting you all decide which games we're going to talk about. We pick three or four, and we always let the fans decide they're the last one. And that's the Hawaii, I still call them the Rainbow Warriors, and the Vanderbilt Commodores. With the history of Oliver Hazard Perry, Battle of Lake Erie. Fresh Vanderbilt is a 17-point favorite at the time of record. Last year, these two teams faced off. 
Vanderbilt, 63-10. to 10. Head coach for Hawaii, Timmy Chang, year two. Let's see what this has got going on. Fresh, what you got for Hawaii, Vandy? Well, yeah, first off, you start looking at Vanderbilt, what Clark Lee's trying to do, because both these coaches actually are trying to build, rebuild their programs and get them to standard. But Clark Lee, what he's trying to do at Vanderbilt is build them up kind of like a Stanford or a Duke, Northwestern under Fitzgerald, outside of the other stuff that's happened there recently. Um, but programs that have high academic standards who can play and be sustainable and find ways to get six, seven wins, be tough, be smart. You're not always going to get the greatest recruits, but you've got to develop and you've got to find those gems and, and build a program that way. Last year, they finished five and seven. You beat Kentucky, you beat Florida. Obviously, you mentioned you beat you know Hawaii. But what's that next step? Do you regress this year or do you find ways to build off it and try to get that six or that seven wins and get to a bowl game and really build a success and supplant that you have something there and you change the culture of Vanderbilt? It starts with this game. Because now you have to replicate what you did last year. You won 63-10. You went out to the Big Island. You took care of business. That quarterback, Mike Wright, was on that team. He's no longer here. A.J. Swan took over middle of the year last year and kind of built the offense. He threw 10 touchdowns, two interceptions. He's not coming back as the entrenched starter. How's he going to be able to handle? How's his offense going to expand itself and be a little more pro prolific and proficient? Their defense last year was bottom of the SEC in every category, um, just about their 14th, 14th, and 14th, whether it's total yards, passing yards, and points allowed. That's never very good, and they were ninth in rushing yards allowed. Offensively, they were near the bottom as well. They've got to find ways to build those categories and get better, find just small wins and small wins and small wins, and keep stacking them. And that really starts with this football game and a home opener. They're still doing some construction in one of the end zones. It's kind of look kind of going to look kind of funky, but go out there and take care of business. Attack a team that's far from home. Um, you are going to be attacking a team in, in Hawaii that is going to be uh, playing with a little extra emotion, I think, dude. Obviously, the fires out there in Maui. This team is going to be playing for home, and you're going to have to deal with that uplift emotion at the very beginning of the football game and sort of sell yourself. And if you know, if you let Hawaii get going or Timmy Chang, that offense might be able to you know, put up some serious points early. You've got to be focused and drive it home. As to Clark Lee, he's got a challenge. I think it's actually a good challenge of playing a team that's dealing with some serious emotions and some serious energy behind them coming this ball game. That gives your team a reason to be focused and ready to play football. Uh, obviously, it's for terrible reasons why they're going to be focused and energized, but you're going to have a, a reason to get up for this football game and be ready to play. When looking at Vanderbilt, um, their top leading rusher last year, Ryan Dave, uh, Ray Davis, he's a Kentucky. So now you've lost your quarterback who really put up points in Mike Wright last year, and you've lost your top leading rusher. How do you replicate this, you know, this offense? A.J. Swan was decent at quarterback, but who's going to be your running back that's going to fill in and fill that void for the Commodores? Will it be one of... Patrick Smith, Chase Galepsi, or are they going to go with the trio of freshmen, Cedric Alexander, Diego Benson, or A.J. Newberry? These guys are all going to be trying to get in, trying to steal carries, trying to figure out who's going to be the, the new lead dog, and you have a chance right now to, to settle it and take a job and own it. What have they done on fall camp? How do they tra that, transition that into a football game or two as the season starts? So I'm, I'm interested to see from running back spot for Vanderbilt, which one or which two want to take over as a lead couple of guys and lead that and build it off for the upcoming season because they're definitely going to need that. And in terms of the passing game, if you're going to be successful, you need the trio of returning receivers to really step up and go, go farther. Will Shepard, Jane McAllen, and Quincy Skinner Jr., they all had decent seasons last year. Can they really elevate, maybe get each of them 500-plus yards instead of 700, 400, 200? What can they all do to elevate their game? Because obviously you're going to be down in situations. You're going to have to have a passing attack and when you get SEC play to keep you in ball games, how are these guys going to show up in week one and really show that they've matured and grown as an offense? That's also what I'm looking because if you have an offense, you'll at least be able to compete against some of the teams in the league and put up points quicker as opposed to being so having to play from the front. And if you get down, you're in trouble. We mentioned that with San Diego State, if you're behind the eight ball, you're kind of in, in trouble. If Vanderbilt's offense can show some improvement and match and show successful drives. I think that's what we really want to see because it's going to pay off down the stretch in the second half of the season in the middle of the season, we're going to have to get those wins. When looking at the other side, last year was the first year in the past five years that Hawaii never went to a bowl game. It's a real rough start. They had four straight years of bowls. Last year was just kind of, it was a dull air. And usually you expect a high prolific offense out there from the Rainbow Warriors on the Big Island, putting up points. They might not be able to play great defense, but they're definitely going to show up and put up big-time numbers in offense. That didn't happen last year. And I know Timmy Chang being on the sideline is a legend there at Hawaii as a quarterback. Does that maybe intimidate some of the new quarterbacks that are playing there? Becomes the kids, guys are coming in, or they feel that fear of like this guy, he's in all the record books. How do I compete with that? Um, as if I'm the head coach, if I'm Tim Chang, I'm like, look, 
I was just the guy who was out there slinging the football. I found the open receiver and made it happen. You've got to instill that confidence in your quarterbacks and in your offense, your receivers. Just go out there and play within the system, and you'll be okay, and you'll be fine. Have the freedom, have the fun, and put up the points. I think another year in the system for this entire offense will be beneficial. Will it pay off week one? I'm not sure, but when they get that thing going and playing Mountain West play, the offense might be able to get some steam and build momentum and go out there and maybe pull off an upset or two. So that's what I want to see coming to this game. Braden Schrager, the leading returning passer. He threw for 2,300 yards and changed 13 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. He's got to drop those interceptions, increase those touchdowns if they really want to be that prolific, high-powered offense that they definitely have tradition out there at Hawaii. On the other side, I really think Diedrich Parson, the running back, is going to have to be a, more of a focal point. He had about 800 yards last year, 11 touchdowns and 187 carries. Can they get him 250 carries? Can he break 1,000 yards, maybe 18 touchdowns, and really add that wrinkle of the running game into a high-spread offense? That really adds you more of a dynamic uh, options there for everybody involved. It puts more points and more onus on the defense to cover the entire length of the field, you know, sideline to sideline and end zone to end zone. And if that happens, then it's man-to-man out there in the, in the field, and you're not having to focus in on just a quarterback or just a, a single receiver. You have multiple options. Developing this offense to another layer is what they continue to need to see there at Hawaii. Their defense definitely struggled. How can they build off of defense and get somebody to get some stops? They weren't very good last year. They didn't really bring in many players this year. So it's going to be all hands on deck, playing in space, playing smart. Um, and the, until they can develop some talent on defense and the offense isn't scoring enough, they're going to struggle to win football games. So it's going to be a balance between Hawaii of scoring a lot of points and giving the defense a break and helping them out. I don't think they have it just right here in the opener, but after probably a couple of games in the middle of the season, they'll start getting a flow. So for this football game, I have Vanderbilt winning 37-17. to 17, But as the season progresses, I think Hawaii will definitely get better. So, Fresh, the best thing about the Hawaii Rainbow Warriors is the haka before the game. Now, Fresh, I know you're probably not up to date on your Samoan history, so I'm just going to educate you here a little bit. The haka is a performance of a war dance that will invoke the spirit of the ancestors of all Samoans and players that have come before. And it's there to prepare players mentally and also give one last warning to the Vanderbilt Commodores that they need to get ready for battle. I would recommend Hawaii doing about five or six of these before the game. They're going to need every ancestor. They're going to need everyone from Dwayne The Rock Johnson to Timmy Chang, everyone with uh, any Samoan blood in them to kind of join together. Here's the weird thing, Fresh. They lost, They got boat raced last year by 53 points. And Timmy Chang in, inherited that team last year. He didn't really have his offense. And this is going to be the interesting thing because everything when I started reading about Hawaii, it was a lot about them shifting to the run and shoot offense. And they're going to be moving to a four wide offense, kind of let them throw the ball all around the field. I'm intrigued because Vanderbilt had one of the worst, and I mean the worst defenses in the entire country. If I remember right, they were in the 120s in points allowed and in up there with in the 120s in yards allowed as well. They didn't really like sure up their defense there. Now, Grant, I don't necessarily think the talent there in Hawaii is the same that they face, you know, when they play Florida or LSU or whoever in, in the SEC. Still, you would expect them to be a little bit better from being where they are. I think this could get very interesting because while you brought up Shager, Tylen Hines is only five foot seven, but he is a really good pass catcher out of the backfield. They say this kid is maybe one of the toughest kids, and with a team full of Samoans being one of the toughest kids on the entire football team, that's saying something. So Everything I found was how tough Tylen Hines is in this game. I'm intrigued really by how much fire Hawaii plays with and how much like how much that's internalized because they've gone through really, really rough times over there. And like you said before, they're talking about all of the devastation that's happened over in the islands, man. It's just been one rough thing after another. And that's impacting them, it's impacting their families. Certain events like that galvanize a team. And I think, don't 
don't think that Timmy Chang isn't going in there and going, giving some sort of rah rah speech. And every kid on that Hawaii team gets the ancestors to come and, and play alongside them during this time. I don't think Hawaii is going to win this game. I don't think they will because I like Vanderbilt. I do like what I've read about AJ Swan in. Uh, fall camp so far and really they're really high on Will Shepard going into this game but Vandy's goal is just a bowl game Hawaii is going to be playing for a lot more than a bowl game now I'm I could very easily see Hawaii winning this game and then going like three and seven the rest of the season like I don't, I don't foresee Hawaii having this amazing season. Maybe I'm wrong here, but I could see them really getting up for a single game. And we've talked about this with young kids. Motivation is key, and that's what I think is going to get very interesting with it. I would stay away from this game. I'm not one that I wouldn't. I really, if I'm in Vegas with this one, I, that part alone with how motivated these kids could be. I might want to play around and, and take Hawaii in the 17 and and see what happens just because, you know, hey, sports and, and real life are a really funny thing sometimes, Fresh, and they can be really funny. The smart money says take Hawaii in the points. The smart money says that. The fun money says let's go with the Rainbow Warriors. I got Bandy winning the game here, Fresh. I don't think it's going to be 63-10. I think that it's going to wind up being both of these offense just putting up mass quantities of points. I'd probably take the over in the game. I might be looking at the over under. I don't know what the over under is right now at the time of record, but I really think that this could get in, to an interesting level. So I'll take Vandy to win. Over under is 55, 55 and a half at the time of record. So I'd take the over in this game. So you're expecting no defense. Like, Give me like a, a 35 to, you know, 25 kind of game, 35 to 30. Last game winning drive. I, I'm expecting like a, a 42-28 type of game. Okay. I, I think that I think I think that Hawaii's gonna hang tough for three quarters and and just maybe run out of speed in it and, and just finally, you know, just not being able to make a play when they need it the most. Uh I got the over going in in this game, but I also think, because both these defense are really, really bad, I think the over is easy money in this one. But I really, I think Hawaii is going to be up for it. I don't think you're going to get a team that's not like really motivated in this game. So, yeah, I'll take the over, and I think Hawaii, I'm going to just be fun today for it. So give me Hawaii and the points, but I'll say Vanderbilt wins outright. So if Hawaii wins, does that basically end the season for Vanderbilt? Because I don't look at their schedule. The last six games, I only I think they have Ole Miss, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, um, Kentucky. It it's it's a it's a tough road to hoe the last six games of the season. If they don't if they don't beat Hawaii week one, there's no chance they're making a bowl game. Like they're yeah four wins would be a, a pipe dream, right? And and I think that's true with both of these teams because. Hawaii, Timmy Chang, like I think I want to see what he's got because he's he learned he was the offensive coach was June Jones back in the day. And June Jones, not only Timmy Chang, but also Colt Brennan. I think he knows offense. I think Hawaii eventually will get back to that offensive juggernaut out there on the island. But I don't think that they're going to be like this great powerhouse. But we'll see. This is going to be an interesting game because I think that it will tell us a lot for both those programs going forward. Will also be probably the only time we talk about them all year long. So it is what yeah. it is. All right, let's go to our next game. This one's, I got a lot more intrigue in this one. San Jose State at USC. Caleb Williams coming back after winning the Heisman last year, but USC losing the last two games of the 2022 season, wind up losing the Pac 12 title game to Utah, getting absolutely boat raced in that game, and then upset by Tulane. Wow. You know, everyone was so high about you. Everyone hated on USC last year, was surprised that they did so well. We weren't because we kind of looked at it objectively. We don't hate Lincoln Riley by any means. We just really didn't care in that regard. We knew how talented Caleb Williams is, winds up winning the Heisman. And USC is currently a 31-point favorite in this game, Fresh. 
I only have really two comments about this game, so I'll turn it over to you and let you go with it. Well, this is mythology madness, I think. You got Spartans and Trojans going after it. Um, forget playing football. Let's just have, you know, the guys get all up in their gear and just go out there and have like a whole sword fight. I think that would be a little more entertaining. Um, it'd be pretty cool. And you definitely uh you know go flashback into the Greek mythology and then that sort of a historical lesson. Um, but bring it on to the modern gridarm. San Jose Spartans, uh, they have an offense. And I think if they can get going and USD hasn't short the defense, they can maybe hang around for a couple quarters in the football game. You look at quarterback Siobhan Cordero, had a great year last year. Ironically, transferred from Hawaii after the previous two years. Last year was at San Jose State, the second year there. Running back Kyrie Robinson, receiver Justin Lockhart. Only, he's the only top four receiver returning, though. So that's the one thing. How can they develop the rest of the receivers from that squad to really get up speed pretty quickly for San Jose State? And then watch out for tight end Dominic Mazzotti. I really think he's 6'4", 252. He had 34 career receptions last year, 425 yards. That's an average of 12 and a half yards, you know, reception. Can he make that next step and become a big-time force at the tight end spot and really become a difference maker, not just in this football game, but in the Mountain West season for San Jose State? So he, he can maybe be the number two receiver that really gets himself into the fold and becomes a nice little playmaker there. Um, but if this offense could get going quickly in this football game, it could really be, uh, you know, detrimental for USC and put them. On, I think that USC is still going to win, but it puts them on their hair, so they're going to keep playing their stars a little bit longer than they probably want to in this football game. They are playing the fourth best offense last year in, in total yards per game in the Mountain West. Is San Jose State? These guys can move the football, and there's no slouches out there in that conference. So expect this to be an offensive football game if San Jose, if San Jose State can get going early. The real thing is I'm looking at from USC is resetting the standard. Okay. Lincoln Riley, you have yet to have a program, but yet to have a squad in your program when you've been a head coach to actually play defense. I don't care if it's Oklahoma or USC. Every defense you have is mediocre at best. Can For one year, you actually get a defense to show up because Caleb's going pro for this year. We have to guarantee he's going to be a top three overall draft pick. Nothing is a guarantee on who the next quarterback is going to be if they're going to be able to shine at his level. Your time right now is to win. You go into the Big Ten next year, you get a playoff bid, yeah, it might expand to 12 teams, but you're not going to be getting one of those top three or four spots because the Big Ten's going to be a lot bigger, and you're going to be down a little pecking order a little bit. So you've got to maximize your chances this year. And that shit comes out, that shows up. You've got to come out this year firing on all cylinders offensively and defensively. I'm not worried about the USC offense. Caleb and company are to get it done and roll, but I'm worried about the defense. Under Pete Carroll, when they won those titles, yeah, they had Matt Leiner, Reggie Bush, Lendell White, a bunch of receivers, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But they had an amazing defense that hit you in the mouth every time you stepped on the field. And that defense put enough fear in people that the offense could do whatever the heck they wanted to do. They could mess around, and the new defense, defense is going to go out there and light people up and get the ball back. For once in your life, can you have a defense that shows up for your squad and shuts people down? And that's what I want to see from week one. Set the standard in week zero. Go out there in the Coliseum and play defense against, a, I'm going to say, an above-average quality offense. If you can get them taken care of, Build some momentum, get some cohesion on that defense, because you're going to get better offenses as you go along in the season. If you can't stop San Jose State in week zero, how are you going to stop Washington, Oregon, Utah, Shade Sanders, and uh, the offense there at Colorado, so on and so forth? How are you going to do that if you can't take care of San Jose State? Be prepared. This is a big testament for you in that program to show you've actually taken that next step and move forward. Because if you struggle in this football game, you might still win it, but it will show that there's kinks in the armor and eventually. That armor is going to get destroyed and fall off, and you're going to lose another chance of playing for a national championship. So you've got to get it get it done in week zero. Start it off strong. Play defense. If you can't come out and do that, I don't care how good your offense is, you're going to see the same result you had last year with a loss to Utah in the title game or a loss to Tulane in the bowl game, and you're going to have all those dreams shattered at the end of the season. Individual awards only go so far. Football is about winning a team championship, and this is where you have to have a defense to balance with your offense, and I want to see it week zero. Are you a true contender or are you going to be a pretender when it comes to when the metal meets the, the highway when it, late, in, late in November? We're going to know this week if you're ready to go, and that will actually be able to become a merit point later on in the year. I think USC wins, I'm going to say 38 to 20, but I really want to see how that defense dominates. Are there early points they're allowing or are they late garbage points? So – I have one note, and all it says is last year, USC allowed 400 yards a game. San Jose State last season 
averaged 367 yards per game on offense. That's the question. So USC, the number is 300 for me. Are you able to hold San Jose State to under 300 yards of total offense? I'm not asking for the world. I'm not asking for you to have this lights-out defensive game where you absolutely dominate to start from start to finish. I'm not asking you to have a top-tier defense. I'm asking to see improvements on defense. Fresh is right here. You could talk all about, like, there's talent over there in San, Di- San Jose State and being able to, you know, throw the ball around a little bit. They got a, a half-decent rushing attack there. But really, all of our eyes and focus should be on USC and this defense. You know, you turn back a guy who is an All-American for us in Kalen Bullock, the safety. He has got to take the leadership role now. He's got to be that quarterback on the field to be able to call out what they need. USC has a history of great safeties, okay? There are some really, really great defensive talent in there. And you can look at this. Is Bullock going to be the next one? If USC is able to hold San Jose State to under 300 yards, this game will be out of hand, quick, fast, and in a hurry. You'll be able to flip over and watch the end of the Notre Dame. Um, well, no, that game sorry, will be already done. That's a little earlier. But you'll be able to flip over and watch another game on this one. I really think that's going to be the question. I'm also a little curious to see what this new offense is going to look like. Yes, you have Caleb Williams back. You no longer have Travis Dye, but you do have Lloyd and Austin Jones. I made the mistake last year of doubting Austin Jones and wound up turning one of his best games this season. Is the Ryan attack going to be there? Is Caleb Williams going to also be able to avoid some of the sacks that he took last year? Took a lot of sack and wound up paying for it. By the end of the year, he was pretty banged up. Is the offensive line able to protect him? Grant, I don't think that San Jose State has a a snowball's chance in hell in this one. But I do need to see these things to feel very comfortable about USC going into this season. Because there is a lot of hype for USC. And realistically, you talk about the first five weeks of the six weeks of the season. Your teams that you're playing are not world be- beaters. So you got to look at San Jose State, Nevada, Stanford, Arizona State, Colorado, and Arizona. And then middle of October, you get Notre Dame. Under no circumstances should USC not be 6-0 and going into that game. But are they a paper tiger 6-0 and where they don't have a defense like they didn't have last year? They're propped up on being able to force turnovers. A lot of the reports, they're really not that high on the cornerbacks that they have over there, so they could really make a long day for it where you're going to have to completely rely on getting quarterback pressure. Again, I'm not saying that there's not talented players over there. I'm not saying that you haven't brought in people, but this is the game that we need to see that those things happen. You're playing a lesser opponent, and you need to just basically put your foot on their throat early on and choke them out. Like This this game needs to be over by halftime. And if it takes even the half time to get this game over with, then I might even start raising questions. Like, personally, me, my goal would be that Caleb Williams is wearing a ball cap and a headset by the third quarter. Like, I'm, I'm pulling the stars and letting the young kids get a run in. With that being said, I think Lincoln Riley's motivated. I think that they have a lot of talent there on offense. I think this is going to be a game where USC really lights up the scoreboard because they know the last taste in a lot of people's mouth from 2022 is very negative on them. I think that a lot of people are, are going to point to the last two losses instead of pointing to all the great things that they did accomplish and the great things of Caleb Williams winning the Heisman. If you don't show out in this first week and kind of like beat the teams that you're expected to beat and like absolutely crush them, then we're going to continue to have questions and you're not going to be able to answer any of our questions until October 14th when you play Notre Dame. So I got USC, you know what fresh? I think that you're, I'm I'm going to say that USC does it today on this weekend. I think that they're going to come in. They're motivated. They're fired up. I'm going to say USC and the 31. I know that's a large spread and I, I have a tendency to stay away from times when I'm seeing 31 on the board, but I'll go USC with the 31 there. I think this game has a tendency to be like a 17 to like 58, 60 type of game. 
Like, I think there's going to be a lot of points. Uh, the over under is set at 64 and a half. I, I think that there's a possibility that USC gets that themselves. Well, you know, the crazy thing is this game's on the Pac 12 network. So who's actually going to watch it? Like, will everyone actually have truly proof the game actually happened? Right. Yeah. Um, if you're looking for a good one, there's a, there's a company that follows us on Twitter that you should check out. You can, I get the Pac 12 chat channels over here. Well, you enjoy watching. Maybe you're one of 12 people watching that game. Eh, if you're coming over this weekend, maybe you can watch it with us. All right, Fresh. Let's go to the game that we got a lot to talk about here. Well, I don't know if we got a lot to talk about, but it's in Dublin. Land of the Irish. Stouts. Blimey stones, Potatoes. Potatoes. Crystals. Salmon. Yeah. All right. Navy versus Notre Dame. In Ireland, everyone's going to want to talk about Sam Hartman, man. Everyone's going to want to talk about Sam Hartman and Notre Dame. I'm interested because game playing versus Navy is not easy. And I go back and I wrote this. This is the first note I have here, Fresh. Going all the way back to 2014, Navy played Ohio State in week one that year. And this is the year Ohio State won the national title. Navy was only down. 20 to 14 to Ohio State entering in the fourth quarter. It was, it's, they're one of those offense that you, because you don't go up against the triple option very often, that they wind have a tendency to really give defenses fits. Um, in that game, they had 63 rushing attempts for 370 yards. I'm the first thing, and one of the main things I, I have in here, if you look at our comment section in our Notre Dame preview, everyone said, oh, this is a great defense. Oh, this is a, you know, you guys didn't give enough credit to the defense there. And I just look and said, where is my proof? And people want to point at like the first game versus Ohio State and Marvin Harrison Jr.'s stat line in that game. But you got to remember, JSN was the number one receiver in that game. And he went down and changed the whole game plan. I need to see Notre Dame's defense just come out and not have any problems with this triple option. Same thing I, I, I'm saying with USC. Notre Dame, you, you have questions from 22. You can, you answered, they answered some of their questions. They beat South Carolina in the Gator Bowl. That looked really, really well. They picked up maybe one of the best transfer quarterbacks in Sam Hartman. I can't wait to see what Sam Hartman ha- is going to do with this offensive line. Like he is going to have all with all over there at left tackle. I think he's going to have all day to throw. I think it's going to be very difficult to get pressure on the Notre Dame um, quarterback. I think they're going to be able to run the football here. But is Navy going to be able to eat up the clock? Like if they can do those, you know, hey, three yards and a cloud of dust, four yards and a cloud of dust, and we just eat eight minutes off the clock in the first quarter, and next thing you know, you're getting like, three drives in the first half, can they do this? Notre Dame in South Bend last year, 35-32 beating Navy. Interesting. What you got, Fresh? I got a few more things, but I'll let you go. Well, Navy is the first game without Kenny Amataloa. He was fired off the uh, Army game last year after a heck of a run, winning his coach there at Navy. How is this actually going to shake up this team? Um, Are guys still not fully ready to go? It was kind of a weird thing with the way the AD did all the you know, the firing and then promoting defensive coordinator Brian Newberry from the staff, the same staff, making him the head coach. It just had a very eerie feeling about it. And this is that, that first debut of that new head coach. How does he transition from a legend at Army, I mean at Navy, to being the head coach now? How does he maintain the defense that he actually improved, but now he's not the coordinator anymore? He's the head coach. How's that going to change? Um, how's the offense? Ken had a way of being with that offense and getting them to tick it the right way. He's that pulse check is gone. How is that going to flip the switch? I'm, I'm interested to see those. You kind of look at the quarterback situation. Ty Lavate, who we've also mentioned from here in Jacksonville, was a was quarterback for a good part of the year last year, got dinged up late in the season, kind of had some struggles from there. Hopefully he's healthy and better take over the reins and move forward this year. If he is, I think that'll give him a spark. Um, just – how is he going to be able to get back into shape and play at a high level? How's the offense changed? That's what I'm worried about. How's the dynamic of this football team? 
yes, they are servicemen. They're going to be professional. They're going to be disciplined, smart, and tough. But they're just, I feel like the firing of Ken Niamatololo just, I, where will this juice be? A lot of the guys recruited by him. They brought him in. He had them playing the right way for many, many years. And I'm just worried how that transition is going to handle here. I'm looking at Notre Dame. You mentioned it. How are we going to see this team start? Last year, they got off to a clunky start, you know, had a couple speechless losses early on. But then they recovered it. They beat Clemson. They had a great run down the stretch. They gave USC all they could handle. They had a huge comeback against South Carolina, win that bowl game. Um, they kind of found their life late in that second half. Is Marcus Freeman, can he continue that, that ball momentum into this 2023 season? Or was that just ending on New Year's Eve or the, the, uh, December 30th last year? And we have to start from scratch all over. If they can come in and get after it and play with the momentum they had from last year, this team could be lethal and they could blow Navy out. I'm still wondering how does Mark Freeman keep this team going? Where have those hits been? Where's the recruiting been? They didn't really have the greatest class coming in this past year up at the top 10 Notre Dame standards sometimes. How are they going to be able to fill those gaps of guys who have left and gone on to the NFL? Um, this is going to be a true accomplishment on Mark Freeman in that program. Yeah, you have Sam Hartman at quarterback, but he wants to throw the ball with four receivers. Notre Dame is not a four receivers spread the ball kind of team out there. Tommy Reese, your offensive coordinator, is gone. He left, you know, after spring practice to go to Alabama. So it's not even a full off season with the new a new coordinator. You're only getting the summer practice because Reese left in the middle of the year. Um, how is this first time out going to look offensively? Are there going to be communication issues? Are they going to have to just run the football and really focus on giving the ball to um, Aud- Audric Easting? who returns 930 yards last year, 11 touchdowns, 135 receiving. Are they going to just run the ball with him, focus on him four yards in a cloud of dust and sort of let them settle and maybe change it, the pace a little bit? They don't get the passing game going. That's kind of what I want to see. Um, I think Notre Dame's defense is going to be fine. You know, Benjamin Morrison at quarterback, J.D. Bertrand linebacker, and a bunch of host of other guys. They're going to be tough. They're going to own the trenches. They're going to have a big offensive line. But where's the sport going to come from in this football game? After the initial surge last year, we all thought Nebraska was going to go in there and they were, you know, this is going to be Scott Frost year, going to go in there and start off the season in, in Dublin and take on Northwestern. And they rolled out a clunker and Northwestern got their only win of the year. And then things really fell off. Um, how is this team going to be able to handle momentum, get themselves focused and ready to play and play at a high level and build off of last year? I'm interested to see what this is going to happen because the spotlight's on them. They're the only game in town. It's a 2.30 kickoff. Everybody's going to be watching NBC. It's not like you can sort of hide on a Saturday afternoon at 2.30 when everything else is happening. You're getting everyone watching you. You want the big lights. Now it's time. Um, I think Notre Dame takes care of business, but I'm wondering about the psyche of both these teams coming in after that initial surge of excitement and who really settled in and ready to play and fully understands their assignments and their, their scheme moving forward in the football game in the season. I think Notre Dame wins 38-10. to 10. I think they take care of business late, but early on there might be some clunky, clunkiness on offense for both teams. Yeah, so they they have some talent on offense. I know we're we're more going to be watching Notre Dame to see what type of defense they have here. Notre Dame's got to make an opening statement, like you like you said, they're the only game in town. And unless you're me and or using some sort of streaming service, they have you're going to miss the USC game. So realistically, you're going to watch the Notre Dame game here, and you're going to need to see something special out of Notre Dame. They have to make a statement. They got to look electric on offense. They lost Mark Michael Mayer last year, but they really like this Jaden Thomas kid. He's another interesting player that could be the next great, like big passing target for them. SMA, you talked about here as well. It isn't three yards in cloud dust with him. He was averaging close to almost six yards a carry last year. That offensive line fresh is so darn good. Like it may be the best offensive line in college football this year. We'll see. I need to see again. I need to see it. I need to see it with my own two eyes. You know, you're going to get the homers from Notre Dame. You're going to get the fans that are going to tell you how great they are in, in fall practice, how great they looked in the spring game. I want them going up against actual people. The thing I love about Navy is that you have players that are so disciplined and they're not going to make mistakes. So, you know, Sam Hartman coming to the line, trying to draw them off sides, not going to happen very often. You know, no, Navy is going to do what they're supposed to do. And you just need to say that we're better than you. And we need to show that we're better than you. 
I got Notre Dame winning this game. I think that they're going to score quick. I think Sam Hart, they're going to give Sam put the ball in Sam Hartman's hands a lot early on in this game. Let him throw the ball all over the field. You got Merriweather there on the outside. He could be very interesting to throw the ball to him. Um, you know, like you said, SMA could could do a, a big one there. But ooh, we got to see something from defense. I really think, because maybe he's talking about that they're going to add a few more passes this year. Folks, they were averaging less than like, I think they threw like 20 passes on the whole season. Like it, In the Army-Navy right. game itself. Right. So they're they're not a high power passing attack team, which for it maybe works for you in this one because that's where Notre Dame's strength is. Benjamin Morrison's one of the best cornerbacks in the country. I'm really high on him. The interesting kid is Hart coming off what he's gonna come back and do. Notre Dame didn't have a whole lot of that tandem on the field together. What does that tandem look like? Now we're not gonna see that in the Navy game here. But in a few weeks, when you got Ohio State coming in, you got two wide receivers that you better be ready for in Abuka and Marvin Harrison Jr. So I think this is maybe the starting point. You know, what are you going to do? I think Notre Dame needs to come out of this game healthy. And the line is only 20 and a half, which is a little sneaky on me. I got Notre Dame winning by three touchdowns. I think they're going to cover the spread here, but I'm going to go something simple like. 31 10 in this game. I don't think it's going to be huge in it. Uh, I like Notre Dame by the just about the spread in this, the three touchdown mark. If that if that line starts creeping up to 21 22, I'd probably start to get a kind of sh- shy away from it. But I like Notre Dame by where they're at right now. I think that they got a lot to prove, and with all eyes on them, they're going to have to make a statement. It's something I've, I've been told you know, many years ago from somebody else. TCOB, take care of business. This is one of those take care of business games where the glitz and glamour, the, you know, the shine of being over there and playing in the lights in this, you know, international setting, you can't let it get too big. You just got to go out there, take a deep breath. We're here to play football, blocking, tackling, run the football, tackle, score touchdowns. Don't get too, you know, flashy and just do what you have to do and take care of business. Um, same thing for USC. Same thing for anybody else who's playing those games where they might think, oh, you know. We're going to win this game walking away. Well, you still have to do it. You just got to go out there, be smart, matriculate it if you have to, but get the W and clear the slate and move on to week two. Yeah, because if Notre Dame's coming back across the water with an L in this game, boy, howdy, watch out. I mean, really watch out. I don't even want to – I don't think it would happen before we get a bunch of Notre Dame fans in the comments here just blasting us on that one. I give the chance of that happening slim to fun, none, favoring none on that one. But, oof, watch out. And also, I think it's be a testament on Marcus Freeman as a head coach because we've seen some clunkers. We've seen some great play in his, in his career so far. Which kind of setting for 2023 can we get consistently up? Can we get the consistent dominance, the high energy, the big-time points, the winning big games? Or are we going to get that up and down, you know, Speaking of the Atlantic Ocean, the waves, up and down, up and down. You want to have a consistent rise. And if he can get that team to keep building off last year, then he's shown he's the right guy and the team is built around him. If not, and he's still keeping those ups and downs, there's going to be some whispers about, does he have control of this program? So this is the first game you've got to set the tone for the season because they get bigger as you move forward. Yeah. All right, folks, that's our Week Zero preview. Hey, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button for us. We are cruising. Our goal is to hit 250 subscribers before week one. We're getting very close to that goal. And the next March is going to be on to 500 subscribers. Hey, hit the leave a comment, like the video, share it with your friends. Hey, and even if you want to, we love when you guys tell us how wrong we are about stuff and that we know nothing about your team. It's great. I love interacting with the fans. And I love interacting with those of you who really like our videos here or our podcast if you're listening online. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from, where's Apple, Amazon Pods, Good Pods. Hey, you guys know I don't know them all, but leave us that five-star review because you guys know Fresh and I were those five-star prospects. Make sure you're going over to SpinnableSports.com because there's so much up there right now. The preseason All-American team is up. It's live. Who made the All-American team for us? Well, I don't know right now because we did it a few months ago. So 
I forgot who I put on my list. I'm going to have to go to SpinnableSports.com to check out who I put on there. So if I'm checking it out, you need to check it out. SpinnableSports.com. Special thanks to our producer, Drew. Without him, none of this is possible. And it's one of those weeks. I'm going to fire up the hibachi grill. I'm going to cook something on that grill this week. I don't know what if I'm going to do patty melts or, or hibachi or, I don't know, maybe some breakfast even for lunch. Mm -hmm. so. All right, Fresh, that's all I got. All right, it's week zero, everybody. Soak it in. We get a lot. We don't get many of these weeks, so enjoy it. Week zero. Get all your games in. Locked in the couch. Have a good time. Bye, y'all.